Everyone, everyone, come in, come in, get comfortable. We are waiting for our special guest to get here. Hope everyone is well. It is almost Labor Day. Hopefully, have it, everybody has safe plans ready for Labor Day. I'm excited. Summer's almost over, but hey. We can't be dark and lovely all year, I guess. <laughs> come in, come in. Welcome, welcome. Get this golden going. Hello, hello, seeing some Oklahoma relatives in the house. Hello. Welcome, thank you for being here. <laughs> hello, Selena, Samir. Hi, welcome. Glad you could join. Get us another Skoden Talks going. She got new weave, so we're trying to break her in. <laughs> she needs some new lashes because this one be wonky sometimes. Like, oh. Hi, hello, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yay. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're excited. Good to see new faces. Love it, love it. I'm not sure if that's Ava's. Ava, if you let me know you're here. I have not seen an Ava pop up. But while we're waiting, if anybody is, just gonna let everybody know, anytime during our um, live, if you have any questions for myself or the guests, pop them in the comments. We will answer them as we go. 
any and all is welcome. Just be respectful. And it doesn't have to be all formal. Oh, okay. <laughs> She's here. Okay. That's what I was wondering. All right. I'm going to go ahead and do my introduction and we will add our special guest. Uh, IP3 is a, oh, well, before we even do that, welcome to Scoden Talks with the Homies. I am your host, Sage Chanel, Auntie Sage. Welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to have another Scoden Talks with you all. I'm glad you are here to join us uh, and we'll go ahead and get started. IP3 is an organization that provides nonviolent direction action training, campaign strategy, and community organizing tools to support indigenous communities taking action in the defense of their homelands. IP3 is currently taking community training requests and they will be having the Skidded Action Camp September 12th through the 16th in the Duwamish Muckleshoot Territories in Seattle, Washington. Uh, for more information, contact info at ip3action.org. So excited about that. And I will go ahead and see if our special guest is ready. Hopefully I didn't slaughter the territories thing. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon or morning. Good afternoon. How's it going? Good Is this okay? Afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. I think I need to turn my volume up just a little bit. But yes, I can hear you just fine. Welcome, welcome. Thank uh, you. If you'd like to, go ahead and give us your little introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, sure, yeah. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Eva Cárdenas. Um, currently, I am residing in Cherokee Territories. I work for the Rapid Society, a project of C2, and I'm super excited to be here with you all. I'm going to be dead ass. This is the first time that I do a live or um, do an Instagram thing, so I was like, I don't know what button to push, uh, but I appreciate the grace and really happy to be here. I hope everybody that's um, up there is doing well. I hope you're doing well. I am doing awesome. So we're we're not too formal. So you can lay back. You can be relaxed. Have you a little uh, drink there just in case you need it. Uh, we're not too formal. We will ask some silly questions here and there. But mainly just sure, want sure. to uplift you and get to know you and know all the amazing work that you do for our indigenous peoples. So uh, we'll go ahead and jump into our first question. And I just wanted to ask, uh, what inspired you to get involved in the human rights work and how does it influence your work today? Um, yeah, I, so I, I was born in Mexico. Uh, my parents are immigrants. Um, and yeah, I kind of, I think as any person who deals with struggle, you just kind of get involved in the work. I started basically interpreting for people around the city that I currently reside and through that, you know, understanding which stuff and just kind of the sink and swim situation where you kind of are thrown into it. Um, but it was very lucky and privileged to be in spaces with amazing people, um, amazing elders, amazing people who have been in this movement for a really, really long time. And um, throughout share experience and just hearing from them and being privileged to be in certain spaces, I feel like I was able to get involved in a, yeah, in a deeper way, in a way that for a really long time, I thought that that was something that was like in the 60s and that that's where it stayed. Um, and just recognizing like the long track that our people have been um, involved in our liberation has been one of the things that just allows me to like do this work. Um, like I said, I'm really privileged to be able to do the work, to get paid to do the work. Um, you know, to have people who can mentor me in particular ways. Um, and just really happy and honored to, to be able to provide at least some kind of support, right? We have so many people right now fighting many different lives, um, not just through like the climate crisis, but also just like the police brutality, the colonization that continues to exist in this country. And I think uh, for us, at least for me, just being able to provide a little bit of that back is, is the least that I can do. Um, it's an honor to work with a lot of the communities that I have a privilege and access to, um, to learn from them and to learn about their struggles. Um, so I think overall, it's just kind of like a cyclical thing of just like through this work, I've been able to do a lot of decolonization for myself um, as a person who has been removed twice from their 
from their homelands um, and trying to figure out who I was when I got here as a migrant kid and then, you know, identifying with the Chicano movement and then understanding that within Chicanismo, um, we are two indigenous and so the complexity of all of those things. I feel like through this work, I've been able to do that internal work that has allowed me to continue to do this work. So it's a um, kind of like in la cage kind of thing where it's like a feeding of, of the spirit and the soul and that has what has allowed me to do my work better, what has provided me to continue to do my work, and I feel to some degree that has allowed me to be of support to my peoples um, in our liberation. So I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, how does that influence your work today? Like, um, was there any, like, anyone while you were going well, was there anyone that was, like, influenced that? you know that was like that helped get to where you are today or did you basically just have to go through it uh as time was on and kind of did your own thing yeah i mean i think it's a process it's hard to just name one person you know i feel like even from my abuelita in mexico who would sometimes say some some stuff some revolutionary stuff that i, I didn't quite understand to the people that i meet today um you know i think there's always a learning process around that. And so that's what influences my work. Um, I've been doing a lot of like going back into my own people's history and like, understanding their struggle within their timelines, um, understanding what are some of the things that we're still probably holding on to around myths and assumptions. And like, so a lot of that work, I feel like helps us understand why we are in the spaces that we are and how do we continue to uh, fight against some of the recycle narratives that the dominant culture continues to play. Um, so that that is oftentimes helpful, but I do feel like, uh, yeah, just I learn from people every day, uh, which is one of the things that I really like about this work. Uh, it's that you're constantly being challenged around the ways in which we are taught to think, right? Um, we're taught to say particular things, but not to question it critically. And I think through this work, there's that concept of like, we need to question things. Um, and we need to constantly be in a, in a process of questioning so that we can transform and then we can uh, reiterate or tweak the plan and then try again so that we can continue to fight for a struggle. And I think that for me that, yeah, there is no not one person. I mean, you know, even my kid, it clocks me on the daily and I'm always learning from them. So, um, yeah. yeah. And again, I'm gonna just let our guests know if y'all have any questions uh, for her during this uh, interview, Go ahead and put them in the, I'll pop them in the comment section and we'll get them read to her and hopefully we can get an answer for y'all. Uh, yeah. So during your travels as a, a migrant in Georgia, did you find any uh, roadblocks that you found uh, very difficult uh, growing up? Like, did you know the language? Did you know English when you came here or did you have to learn it really quick for your family and everything? Uh, no, I so I got here when I was 10. Um, I started fifth grade and I got here, I think it was like early June and between June and August, I learned two phrases and that was like, can I go to the bathroom and where is, or how do you say, I think, how do you say, and then the word. Um, and then I took about a year to learn English and I think part of that, that process in itself was really traumatizing in a lot of ways. I think you know, I, I speak colonial tongues, I speak Spanish and English. And so um, there's a lot of racism, classism within within language and how we hold language, right, even the study of language itself. But what I do remember very vividly was my parents being really adamant about like, we're not going to speak Spanish in this house, we will speak in English, and this is the way that you will learn it. And so it was a very hard pace model of assimilation. Um, that to a degree allowed me to be able to speak in such a fast way, but I will say that there's something about this language that is still very foreign to me, even though I've been speaking it for so long, even though I interpret on many different ways. Um, but th that was a challenge in itself. It was also a, a challenge to be, when I first got here to uh, what's so-called Atlanta, Georgia, there was very few migrant families. There were a lot of migrant men because of the Olympics and the level of construction that had developed. There was a wave of immigration that happened here. Um, but then as the 
border crossings got harder, then people started bringing their families. And so I was one of the very few Mexican children in the school system um, in, a, in a mainly white, mainly poor black uh, neighborhood. And so, you know, this was right after Black Flight. And so I also was very privileged to be in spaces where we were living with black folks that were able to tell us about what was happening here during the 60s and all of the atrocities that black folks had to endure um, when they were here. And so through that like level of understanding of American history is when I started to kind of ask about like, there were obviously indigenous people here. There were obviously migrant folks here, right? There was a there are these like stories that are not told. And so wanting to learn more about that, I kind of stumbled across the uh, uh, 500 years of Chicano history book at the library. And I was like, oh, that's for me. And ever since then, I just kind of started to, you know, find all the books and try to read as much as I could about Chicanismo and what that meant and how, so like even finding who I was has been like a challenge in the journey in itself. It's been a good challenge in the way that I've been able to like learn my people's history, right? It, I think it's one thing to hear the narrative of the of the Western view about how and why we are here, and then there's a whole different cosmovision that our people hold, um, and there's power in that. And so I think again, being very blessed and privileged to just like be able to have opportunities where I can learn through those challenges, but. Yeah, I would say English is still a challenge for me sometimes. I'll like break into Spanglish when I get really nervous or, you know, if I get really mad, I'll just start speaking Spanish because that's the <laughs> first time that I had. Um, but yeah, just try to hold those complexities and just being like, okay, you know, uh, it's a complex history that we have to hold, but it's also a beautiful history. Um, oh, yes. And uh, I can relate to that so much because, like, I remember growing up, like, my grandfather and my grandmother met in the boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we were taught, too, also, like, you need to learn English. You have to go to school. Otherwise, you're going to get ran over. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was taught to us very early. And then probably when we were, like, teens, they were just like, okay, now it's important for you to learn your language because now we're losing it. So mm -hmm. it's been, like, a hard battle. And, like, I remember knowing a lot of my language when I was younger, but now it's very challenging. Um, I don't use it every day. I don't have like a fluent speaker I can actually speak to. And there's mm -hmm. a kid, he's in our language class and he like, came up to me and he was just kind of like, how, how high can you count? And I was like, I can count to 10. And then I went to go count and I can't even count to 10 anymore. I was like, ah. Oh. So now it's like, I need to get back into these classes. I need to get back because I was like, I'm losing it. I didn't even know I was losing it, but yeah, it's yeah. so important to have that around. Cause I'm just like, oh my gosh, uh, it's, it's yeah. crazy. But yeah, um, language. language is a powerful thing. You know? it is. I'm, a, I'm a nerd when it comes to that. And especially like there's words in our languages too that we don't have in English that translates. And that's mm -hmm. so important too. I'm just kind of like, I, I'm gonna, I hope we don't lose our languages. I hope that is not where we're headed. I mean, it looks that way, but I think we've got just enough time to save what we have that's so precious to us. That's just ours. So yeah, makes you think just a little bit. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah so um, migrating here, how did you, how did the uh, Georgia Latina Alliance come about? And can you tell us a little bit about that and the Ruckus Society? Yeah, uh, so GLAR, the Georgia Latina Alliance for Human Rights, is, has been my political home. Uh, it, it saw me, it, I was a baby, or I was, I was just a baby, and then I learned organizing from them. Um, so GLAR is a grassroots organization that has been around for, I want to say, at least three decades. Um, so Adelina Nichols, who is the director, um, along with a large group of community members now, have done amazing work to connect different communities across Georgia. So um, Georgia, like many, many southern states, has, has different levels of engagement with their communities, and we work in different sectors. Um, one of the things that Georgia has, though, is that we're very spread across, and, and GLAR has been really good about organizing comités populares or popular committees across um, the South. So throughout, like, the smallest towns to the South, to Metro Atlanta, um, they constantly organize people, they educate people around their rights, 
Uh, we, they have a hotline for people who are arrested and or detained and might have questions around the process. They do a lot of political education around um, not just immigrant rights, but also the intersections between the carceral system, immigration, and obviously police brutality and the mass incarceration that it comes to black and brown folks um, and why that is. Um, they've been uh, one of the strongest muscles here when it comes to making sure that people go out and you know mobilize, go out and both go out and get organized. Um, they have a very good political analysis about the working class because they themselves are the working class, and so it's not coming from a perspective of a ED that you know is living in this particular sector of life, not understanding the struggles of people. It is truly the people talking about their issues and trying to figure out how to change their conditions. Um, so it does run like a popular model of, of education. Um, I started to organize there, honestly, because I was seeing the things around the DREAM Act. So in 2010, I want to say, 2009, there were a lot of undocumented folks that were organizing to pass a bill called the DREAM Act. Um, and there was a lot of mobilization that happened around that, and I was very fortunate to meet, meet my best friend, Gina, uh, who was uh, at the time organizing around this. and. She was like, yeah, come through, we'll talk about it. And, you know, next thing I know, I went to a meeting, then there was a job opening at GLAR, and I was like, I'm just going to try it. And I started to organize. Um, it was it, it was one of the most amazing jobs. I think I have learned to do so many things because of that job. Like, I can have so many different skills. Um, I had to do a lot of emceeing and a lot of interpreting and a lot of, like, you know, talking to community. But through that, I also was able to, Get sharper about what I thought my people's conditions were versus what they were actually at. Um, and that was very informative for me just in terms of how we move as organizers and how we like actually are sharpening our muscle around strategy. And so um, GLAR continues to be the, the place that I'm just like, what is GLAR doing? How are they moving and why they're moving? And I think it's um, important to follow the lead of frontline community members. Um, you know, oftentimes when we are in spaces forget about all of these other conditions that people are enduring and so it's important for us to constantly like be grounded around why we're doing the things um in 2000 and i want to say 11 2012 there was a sb 1070 hv uh 639 hv 87 there were all these anti-immigrant legislations that we were seeing being spread out through, by like the white tank tanks of the world that you know continue to still be out there these are the different organizations that sell basically the legislator to the gops and they just like kind of fill in their crappy stuff and then they, they they're basically testing different laws and so hv 87 which was a law that would criminalize uh, mixed status families uh, for a living and just cohabitating with their undocumented family members. Um, it would basically uh, make people felons in that way. And so we reached out to the Rucker Society uh, to do some trainings around direct action. And so the Rucker Society is an organization where a national network of direct actions and practitioners uh, which we train around the use of direct action and what uh, what that skill is, right? Um, like organizing is one of the many tools that we have at our disposal to ensure that we can leverage some of our people power to meet our demands. Um, oftentimes, because we're people of color, the way in which the police and the state responds to us is very different. And so um, just like IP3, part of our work is to ensure that we're like reaching out or be, or going when we're called to be able to provide support for those communities and to scale people so that the skill resides and lives within those communities so that they are not then later on dependent on other people. Um, and also acknowledging right, like that our communities have been fighting for a really long time and we have a lot of these tools already. We might just not be able to articulate them in that way. And so trying to figure out those tools that our people already hold so that we can scale them up um, to get closer to their campaign work. Um, so that's how I met Ruckus. I kind of was like, ooh, direct action is kind of what I like to do. I had already seen other things in the past, but you know, just kind of seeing people uh, mobilize communities do beautiful art and just like keep this like cool vibe and just like uh, joy within struggle was beautiful and I was like I want to be part of this community and so I started to be like how can I train what can I learn um, 
And next thing you know, I was at an IT3 camp. I think it was one of their first camps uh, as a student trainer. And that was really scary, but also really cool. And I learned a lot. And I just kind of, yeah, I've I kind of been here since, since then. I don't think I'm going to go anywhere anytime soon, to be honest with you, because I like El Desmadre. Like, I do love a little bit of chaos. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan of it. So, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's kind of, it's kind of intertwined because, you know, I still work with Glar in a lot of ways. I, um, I don't, I don't do a lot of, as much organizing as I, I want to. Um, but right now, because of the things that are happening around Cop City, we're here to support, we're here to throw down. And it's been, it's been really um, amazing to see all of the different organizers that I've met throughout years come by uh, or whenever I'm out on the road and see people that I've like met from years before. Uh, and to hear them talk about Glar, to hear them talk about Ruckus, I'm like, yes, like, our people are the shit. Sorry, I don't know if we can curse here, but yeah, um, <laughs> it's exciting. Uh, you mentioned the IP3 camp. Would you tell us about your experience there and uh, anything that you had learned or what you got to take away from the camp that you used? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel like usually when I go to camps, I go... I have to like train so or I go to help logistics so it's never like I get to be a part of the a part of the participants but uh the the first IP3 camp that I went was in Colorado um, I had never been so just beautiful you know like just taking it all in it's been like beautiful um and then one of the main things that I did learn from from camp outside of just like you know you are in a space with people for a while so you have to learn how to live and govern yourself in a particular way so that's a really good skill about it i think that that's what i enjoy most about camp like it allows you it gives you the opportunity to be hands-on about it right when we train and we talk to people about direct action it's sometimes oftentimes it's in a very theoretical way because we're explaining basics or we're going over concepts uh, but it's another thing to have to work with a team for four days you know it's it's a whole thing to be with someone for that long of a period to share space, to learn things, to get to know one another, and then to collaborate to get something done. Um, so that's one of the things that I loved about camp, that I just feel like any everybody who has the opportunity to attend should try to make it because it's such a good experience. I mean, not, you're not just learning a skill, right, that's going to be useful in the scenarios that you are. You're getting to talk to people that have done particular skills, that have gone through certain experiences, that have a lot of knowledge and, like, can teach you or – Say, hey, you might want to think about doing that in this way because when we did it, yeah. it didn't go well, you know? It can give you a lot of heartache and heartbreak. And then um, you just get to meet cool people that are, are, like, fighting similar things or are even fighting different things that you hadn't even acknowledged. You know, you get to network and talk to people about different experiences and you get to connect uh, for further opportunities to collaborate. And I think that it, camp that in itself is just a beautiful thing. Um, when you have to work at camp, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but for participants, if you ever get to go, you should definitely do it. I highly recommend it. Um, and yeah, you get to learn the skill that, you know, I think knots, people don't realize how important it is to know how to tie knots and all the different things that a knot can do, you know? And so, yes. yeah. <laughs> I grew up military and they taught me out too many. I'm just like, oh my gosh, but they're so helpful. <laughs> they're so helpful. <laughs> And the smallest things and the biggest things in life. Uh, so you say you like to do direct action work. And I read that you had uh, went to, um, let me see where I'm at on my notes, at Standing Rock. Could you tell us about your experience at St uh, Standing Rock and why that work is so important? Yeah, so Ruckus was uh, invited to go and support IP3 uh, with some of the orientation trainings that people were doing once the invitation came out um, to Sunny Rock. And so uh, we were deployed to do some support around basically orientation and training. Um, I think it's very important for us to understand that there are, there are people in governance and there are people in profit whose main goal is to make money. Um, and that's a cost of everything, right? Um, and I think oftentimes, because we live in a capitalist world, we're not tend to think about the um, what's going to happen when there is no more drinking water, what's going to happen when we don't have access to land that can provide us nourishment, right? Um, and so 
I think sometimes people tend to say, oh, I want to stand in Iraq because I wanted to stop the pipeline. Um, and I think a lot of us want to stop the pipeline, but also because we understand that at this particular moment in our lives, and not just here, right? We've been, we've been told about this for a couple of years ago, that the climate crisis is a thing, that our people um, are going to be suffering. And uh, let's be real, the main people that are going to be at the brunt of climate change is going to be poor people. So it's not going to be the people that are making the decisions to destroy your earth because they are hoarding wealth, they are hoarding resources, and they have a plan for when those things happen. And I know sometimes people are like, oh, that sounds kind of like you're over here doing some, uh, what do they call that, conspiracy theories, but it really isn't. That is, this is how capitalist system moves. And so I think for a lot of us, this fight is not just about stopping the pipeline, but it's also about demanding that we treat Mother Earth the way that it's supposed to be treated, because we recognize Mother Earth to be a spirit that gives us life and that we are here because of it. And so in defense of our lives and in defense of Mother Earth and in defense of all of the people that are here, I think a lot of us were called to uh, show up and support in whatever way that seemed like. Um, I think for us as an organization, you know, we were called and we did that. I went obviously because I work for Reckless, but also because um, I was very clear that uh, none, nothing in governance, nothing that this current state, the state is not going to give us our freedom. Uh, the state's not going to be like, oh, no, you're right. We made a mistake. Let me rephrase that. They're not going to do that. Their main thing is how much money I can make because it's a short-term vision for them. Um, and because it's not, they're, they're not going to struggle, so they don't really care. And so I, it was more of like, I want to stand up for myself. I want to stand up for my people. I want to stand up for the people that are there and that are defending and have given so much. Um, and that continue to give so much uh, for a country that continues to exploit our people. Um, and so we went through Standing Rock. We were there for a couple of weeks. We did some initial trainings for people who were coming into um, into the, the camp to kind of talk about how you show up, right? Uh, if you're a guest, how do you show up, especially when you are non-Indigenous um, and you show up to places that... Uh, and so... We went to do those particular kinds of trainings. We went to school people around how to show up when we do mass direct action. Um, and so that was that was a very a different way of training because it was a larger group of people. It was a shorter amount of time, but it was for very specific purposes. Um, and we did a lot of like support around art and just you know uh, making sure that our people understood that our fight for life is is a fight that encompasses our our whole beings. Um, it is, I think, to me, a lot of ways in the concept of being like, right, you are my other me. And so uh, we wanted to ground it around ceremony. We wanted to ground it around respect for the land, respect for the people. Uh, and we're hoping that the trainings would allow to kind of create a container for people to know this is how we're going to move as a collective, right? Uh, when we talk about movement, we also want to think about how we govern ourselves and how we govern as a group. And so, like, there were a lot of group agreements and a lot of hard conversations. And so... That was also really interesting to see um, how people just came together and were like, we're going to run a kitchen and we're going to feed people. Or the medics, you know, getting together and training other people to medic. Um, and just how how strong community can be when they come together for a particular purpose. That is awesome. Uh, from that experience, too, was there anything that was, was there something, like, that you got to take away from there that you came there that you didn't know that you already knew? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, there were so many lessons learned from, from Sydney Rock, you know, I think from the point of me, just like working in this environment, just kind of like how the state moves and how dirty they can play, how dirty they are, um, how corrupt they are, you know, uh, we see things like the mass surveillance of people that still continues to this day. We see how the state is dissenting and continues to dissent. Um, you know, a lot of those lessons, they're bringing it up here to Atlanta with the Pop City, and I'm sure that in other places, in Appalachia, and where other people are trying to stop um, that this kind of environmental destruction, you know, there's a lot of lessons to learn from Standing Rock and how the state moves. I think there's also, like, a lot of lessons learned from us around how we show up for one another and how we take care of one another, how we're dealing with grief, how we're dealing with this very, like, you know, we're always and the go, 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 and it's, it feels dire. And like it's, I think it's for us, it's a question of like, how do we continue to build that capacity so that 
the leaders that are coming up have all the tools that they need and that we have sort of like a, a like hey these are some of our lessons right like these are some of our how do we like how do um cultivate how do we cultivate those those teachings for younger people because they're the ones that you know are continuing to like lit this fire like i i love young organizers because they will question you they'll be like you talk to me about accountability how are you being accountable and that's yeah. real that's like that's what we need and so i'm like what you know how do we continue to like do that work so that um the folks that are coming from you know they're coming after us are, are gonna kick butt so like yeah i there's so many things that i feel like i could talk about and i'm like i don't know we could yeah we could go scary route we could go happy route i don't know we can do it all. Whatever yeah, you want yeah. to talk about, we are here for it. We are here to uplift yeah. you, honey. But. Yeah, but I will say, I will say one of the things that I feel like um, what was a big lesson is like direct action is a thing that our people understand. We might be speaking it in different terms. We might be saying different words for it. But like our people, you know, our people have done direct action from the beginning. They have done rebellions. They have they have stood up for our people throughout time and there's so many things that we can learn from our communities that um yeah just for me it was like what are the lessons that i need to ask of my elders what are the stories that i need to ask what, what's that oral history like around our struggles and how we've like resisted this state and was um, there a lot of elders there that was there to help with that kind of stuff too was there a lot of uh, older ones to pass on yeah Any i think i think that there's just been a lot of like folks who have been in these struggles that are like we you might want to think about how this state is going to move or just even studying you know the the counter intel pro program that the government ran against uh freedom fighters in the 60s right from aim to like the black panthers like all of the different tactics that they utilized uh were things that we were constantly like thinking about and and figuring how do we support it and that even to this day right like when we see people right now in atlanta being charged for domestic terrorism for trying to protect the forest after someone was murdered um it's very resonant of like that period of time and i think uh there's always elders that we we check in on and we talk about um but that was one of the things that for me that stood at the most i was like oh wow like their playbook really hasn't changed they continue to get away with it because they sometimes bank on our, I guess, short-term memory of events because it's been, you know, it hasn't been that long, but it has been a generation ago. And so if those stories aren't told and those stories get lost. So similar to language, you know? So awesome. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, where am I at again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is in the future plans for Miss Ava? And is there anything you would like to highlight or plug? Ooh, I don't know. I just, I, listen, I'm just out here and like trying to do my best every day. Uh, <laughs> that's, been my, that's been my thing this year. I, I have this list of things that I want to do. So hopefully at some point I will. Oh no, actually, yeah, there's one. Uh, I am going to the IP3 camp coming out. And I'm gonna learn how to climb because I have been wanting to climb forever. Uh, I've been like, yes, I wanted to go to the camp and learn how to how to climb. And then I just like go do other things that are camp related. I don't do it. So this time I will. I'm really excited about that. I'm super super excited um, because I do want to climb. The one thing that I want to plug um, for folks that I feel like I've kind of plugged here and there is two things. Uh, the first one is Rutgers has a scholarship that we give out for people who are doing action. So if you are an affinity group, if you are a community group, and you're like, oh, I need money for paint, I need money so that we can get transportation out because we're doing a rally, we're doing a march, we're doing a blockade, we're doing all these amazing things, apply. It's ruckus.org slash apps, ACP. Um, and we can grant up to 1,250 bucks for um, action materials and um, other action related items. Um, so we're encouraging people, you don't have to be a nonprofit, um, especially if you are an affinity group, we're constantly encouraging to do that. Uh, the other thing that I do want to plug is for uh, people to keep their eyes on Atlanta and what's happening right here with the South Cop City fight. Um, currently right now there is a referendum happening. Uh, a lot, we have gotten a lot of people to sign and we also know that the city of Atlanta 
and the Casco people continue to are going to continue to fight it, and most likely will try to say that they don't agree with it. Um, there are a lot of other ways that people can join. We are encouraging people to go to the Stop Cop City website um, and to look at all of the different people. And by people, I mean agencies and companies that are going to profit from building this Cop City. Some of these addresses and names are not in Atlanta, are in other states. And I encourage people who are watching right now to call and ask uh, those different institutions and corporations not to collaborate with Cop City. Um, there was someone that was murdered in that forest. Uh, that forest was a lot of, um, you know, cost a lot of life. And they're about to give $90 million to a facility that's going to further train police officers, not just from Atlanta, but from other states, from even the Gilly program. Um, and, you know, that also includes the Department of Immigration, um, the Department of any other law enforcement. Um, and so when we have a housing crisis in Atlanta, when we have um, an issue with security, when we have potholes in our inner state, um, I think we can use that money in a different way. So just encouraging people to continue to look up in the different ways in which they can get involved and to also push the different uh, powers that be to fight against this dissent. The different tactics that we're seeing as to how the state is responding to people organizing and mobilizing to do action is problematic, right? If they're able to get away with charging more than 20 people with domestic terrorism charges. In the city of Atlanta, they're going to be able to do that anywhere. And I would argue that they're already trying to do that everywhere. And so I just want to encourage people to not um, not forget to kind of agitate against that and challenge that question of, who, like, who is actually the terrorist here? Who is actually the people that are causing the harm? And why are we, going back to this language thing, right, why are we choosing those particular words during this particular moment? Um, so I want to encourage people to continue that fight, to continue to challenge the ways in which we are taught about punishment, in which we are taught about who is criminal and who isn't and why, and encourage other people that you hear around that because, you know, when we study history, sometimes we're like, oh, man, I can't believe that happened. If I were there, I wouldn't have believed it. And it's like, yeah, you would. You're, like, sending, you know, your fear sending you the WhatsApp chain about, you know, this conspiracy theory like yes people if we don't challenge what we are being told yeah some of us will believe it and so let's continue like critically i think that that's my foot i will want to encourage people to critically think about the things that they're being told and to challenge them on a daily absolutely challenge the challenges honeys <laughs> you will be, you'll be amazed what you find out <laughs> you'll be amazed so one last question and it is off the wall. Just I like to ask all my guests, yes. is there a favorite indigenous dish that you like to fix or is there a favorite indigenous dish that you just love and crave of all time? You know what? Yes, I love esquites and tacos. Like that is, um so esquites are basically corn on a cup in Mexico. They have them with like limon and chile and a little bit of cheese. And they're just the best. And sometimes they have this herb called el pasote, which I don't know how to say in English. Um, but it's a very, like, a minty green leaf. Um, it's very delicious, and I, I love, I would just eat this all day and every day if I could. But the other thing that I really love that I would eat, even in my saddest days, are tacos. And I think yes. tacos are the amazing food, right? Like, you have the tortilla, but you also have the cilantro and the cebolla. And I want to be honest, these are the tacos I'm talking about, the ones with cilantro and cebolla. Because the onion and the cilantro are also um, digestives. And so mm -hmm. our, our people were like, what is the portable food that I can make that's portable, <laughs> delicious, and also healthy, right? Like, it's just like, we just study, yeah, we just study indigenous culinary, or people just like the way our food is you know, it helps our system, and it's just like it allows us to be well and be well in the world. Um, yeah, but tacos and skitas are my, my main thing. Sounds delicious. Now I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to tacos like I'll be right back. <laughs> it is time for lunch. Well, thank you yes. so much, Ava. I hope you have a blast in Seattle, Washington. It is so beautiful up there, and that is probably the best place to start climbing. Um, 
so take your camera or have a camera ready because there's so many eagles up there. It is just so beautiful. If you get to see a bay while you're up there and the tide goes out, they usually go, uh, the eagles go fit our feet on the salmon up there. Oh. Beautiful. I cried because I, I, there was like hundreds of them here in Oklahoma. I think there's maybe like one or two eagles to a, a lake and you, it's, you barely see them. But when I got to go to Seattle, Washington, I got to see them. I, I was like, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Yes, I'm excited. I'm super excited. Uh, it's just so beautiful. And be be prepared for the rain. It rains a little bit up there. But in the uh, the evergreens up there, when it rains, though, that cedar smell is just, uh, it's so lovely. So Yeah, I'm excited. I'm, ex I'm excited for you. And thank you again for joining us on Scoding Talks with the Homies with your Auntie Sage. I hope you have a blessed day, and we will see you again around soon. Thank you. Take care, y'all. Take care. Thank you.